once upon a time. Super Duper Man was flying overhead looking for an adventure, somebody to save, somebody in distress, you know, a ship to lift out of the ocean and put on top of a house, something like that because he was a superhero. He's flying around and he saw Darth and Joe Vader's house below him. Darth and Joe are old friends of his, so he decided to st fly down and stop in to say hello. And when he landed, what he didn't realize was that his other friend, Man A's man, had been visited was visiting Darth and Joe also and had accidentally left a huge puddle of mayonnaise in front of Darth and Joe's house. And so when Super Duper Man landed, whoosh, he slid on the mayonnaise and he couldn't stop sliding. Whoosh, 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 and he slid into the barn on the side of the house uh, next to Darth and Joe's house and he, Super Duper Man was a pretty big guy. So when he hit the barn, it smashed into millions of pieces and wood splinters everywhere and nails and screws and paint. Darth and Joe and Manet's man ran outside to see what was going on. And just about then, uh, Nostro Man um, came out to take a look, and he saw the mess, and he said, Oh, this is terrible, this is terrible. I know, I'll blow this wood out of the way. And Nostro Man blew. <laughs> and the wood flew out of the way, and all that was left was Super Duper Man, and he was holding something in his ha hands. What's that? asked Manet's man. I don't know, it's a box. It was buried inside this, uh, inside the barn or something. And Darth and Joe looked at it and they'd never seen it before. It was a big white box. It was about the size of a shoe box. You could put a couple of shoes in there if you wanted to, but it didn't look like a shoe box. It was made out of some kind of hard metal like titanium. And, uh, must have been, must have been, must have been buried inside the barn. Maybe, maybe it was inside a part of the wall of the barn, said, said Darth. And Darth's mother, of course, came out by this time because she heard all the sound of the barn being smashed up. And she said, oh no, the barn. And Super Duper Man said, I'm sorry, I'll fix your barn, ma'am. I found this box. And she said, oh, I've never seen that before. And uh, unless, unless that's the box that Aunt M uh, was talking about, Aunt Em, said Darth. What, what did Aunt Em talk about? Well, Darth's mom explained that when she was a little girl, her older sister, Aunt Em, um, ha said that there was something important that was hidden in the barn and that it had to stay there forever for the safety of the universe. That must be what it is. Well, let's see what, what's inside the box. So you know, it's kind of stuck, but Super Duper Man had Super Duper strength, so he pulled open the box and inside there was some white tissue, and if you shuffled around inside the tissue paper, there was a single red ruby, a sort of a jewel, and it was very beautiful. And Super Duper Man said, oh, that's pretty, and he picked it up, and, and Darth reached over and took it out of Super Duper Man's hands because he was afraid that Super Duper Man would break it by accident because of his Super Duper strength. And when he was holding it, it started glowing, and, they, and they, everybody said, wow. And Joe Vader said, maybe that jewel has some sort of super power to it because it's glowing and it was in a secret hidden box. And then, just then, the sky started getting darker. What? Is it about to rain? asked Nostro Man. And he looked up. But no, it wasn't a rain cloud going overhead blocking out the sun. It was a giant spaceship. In fact, it was Death Star 2 the new improved Death Star. They knew it was from the Emperor because the, the Empire is the, are, are the only people who have Death Stars these days. And they looked up and it was filling up the sky. Oh my gosh, we've got to get out of here. We have to warn people, it could be an attack. Well, Darth and Joe had this new spaceship they got on the other side of the tape, which spun around and had a cloaking device and could become invisible. And so they quickly got into their spaceship. They were tra training to be Jedi warriors. And Nostro Man and Man A's Man got in with them. And Super Duper Man, he can just fly on his own. So he just flew. And they flew up in the air. And they put on the cloaking device so that it was invisible. And, um, and then they used their radio to communicate with the Death Star. And they said, attention, Death Star 2. This is Darth and Joe Vader and our friend Man A's Man and Nostro Man. We're... In, we're wondering what are you doing hovering over our planet so ominously and then there was silence for a while and then a voice a voice came on it was sounded like it could even be the emperor's voice and he said darth and joe vader we have sensed the rune stone the rune stone they wondered and super duper man w was wondering the same thing because he could hear the voice also give it to us 
We know it is here. Give it to us or we will destroy your planet. And Darth and Joe knew they were in trouble. We, we can't give it to them, said Darth and Joe. It might be something powerful, but, but we can't let them destroy our planet. What are we going to do? We're going to have to transport onto their spaceship. So, Nostro Man, you take the controls. Don't let Mayonnaise Man touch the controls of the ship because they'll get them all covered with mayonnaise and then there'll be a big accident. So, um, we're going to transport onto the Death Star and uh, try to see what's going on. But, but they'll destroy your planet. Well, they can't destroy the planet when they don't know where the stone is because they'll destroy the stone, too. They want the stone from us, so I think they're just going to try to scare us into giving them the stone. And so Darth and Joe used their rings of transportation, and they transported onto the, onto the Death Star, Death Star number two, and they, ha they brought along with them the, ru the ruby. But then Joe had an idea. I have an idea, said Joe. Let's get, get another ruby stone, a fake one, and then maybe we can trick them into taking it and see what they're going to use it for. I thought that, thought that was an excellent idea. Where are we going to get a, a fake ruby, though? Well, well, we could go to the in-between universe. Maybe Dr. Zhivago would have something like that. And so they transported into the in-between universe, into a big white room, and they knocked on the door of Dr. Zhivago. Darth and Joe, it's so good to see you, said Dr. Zhivago. Haven't seen you in, oh at least 15 minutes since your last adventure. Oh, well, that's not important now, said Darth. What's important is, see this stone? The, I mean, this stone? Well, sort of a rune stone. Uh, you can call it a stone if you want. Oh, it's beautiful, and it's glowing. It, this isn't the legendary stone of, of Athadar, is it? Well, we don't know. We found it in our garage, uh, kind of in our barn. Uh, a friend of ours smashed the barn by accident, and, and this stone was in a box. And Dr. Zhivago said, here, we have to go take this stone over to the um, jeweler, jeweler to look at it, to see exactly what it is. Um, and Darth and Joe said, well, see, back in our universe, the evil emperor wants the stone. Hmm, there could be trouble. Well, let's go analyze it. And don't worry, you have plenty of time because, of course, as you know, time stops in your universe when you're in the in-between universe. And so they went over to the jeweler's house. His name was Fred. And he looked at the stone through his special glasses, and he said, hmm, incredible. The molecular structure in this stone is like none other I have ever seen. It's so compact, it portends great powers. Powers? What's powers? It's very similar to power, but with an S at the end. Oh, I see. Well, what, what, what could it be used for? I don't know, but it's, it certainly is something that could be very dangerous in the wrong hands. And Darth and Joe instantly knew that the Emperor's hands were the wrong hands for that stone. Well, what we'd like to do, Dr. Zhivago, said Darth, uh, it was really Joe's idea, is get a fake uh, stone and, give it, and try to trick the Emperor. Excellent idea, they thought. And so the, the jeweler worked in his laboratory and created an identical stone, which also glowed when you touched it, but of course had no power whatsoever other than the glowingness of the stone. And the fake stone Darth held, and the real stone Joe held, and they transported back onto the Death Star 2 into an, a hallway, and there were a couple of stormtroopers, but um, they both had rings of invisibility, or they had their ring of invisibility, so they were able to slip past the stormtroopers up to the main headquarters where the emperor would be hanging out, trying controlling the ship and doing his evil emperor things. And they knocked on the door, and they heard a voice say, Who is it? And they said, It's Darth and Joe. You called us? They, oh, I didn't expect you to see you here. Well, come on in. So they opened the door, and he said, You have my stone? And Darth and Joe said, Do we have your guarantee that you won't destroy our planet if we give you this stone? And he said, yes, you have my word as the emperor that I won't be destroying your planet. And so they gave him the fake stone. And he said, at last, the stone of Akabar. Akabar, I thought you could, oh, whatever. This is the stone. This is the ancient rune stone. What are you going to do with it? Ah, uh, I guess it's all right for me to tell you since you'll all be dead soon. <laughs> That's the way he laughed sometimes. And what's that? And he slid open a door, and behind the door, there was a single machine, 
It was a round globe with tubes coming out of it. And he placed the stone in the center of it. And he said, now, finally, I have the ultimate weapon. With this stone, Death Star number two will be able to destroy an entire galaxy with one single shot. Nothing will be able to stop us. We will rule the universe. And, um, and Darth and Joe started backing up slowly. Well, we'll be going now. And he said, go, do what you want. I'll destroy your planet anyway. I lied. I do that because I'm an evil emperor. <laughs> and so Darth and Joe ran out, and they transported back to their spaceship. And Mayonnaise Man had made, made a mess of everything, but Nostril Man was blowing the mayonnaise off the controls, which kind of spun the ship around in a weird way. But Darth and Joe were able to get control, and they landed back on the planet. Meanwhile, Super Duper Man had bumped into a tall building and was shaking his head. Oh, my head. And they landed on the ground. And then they heard a voice saying, What's wrong? It's not working, Darth and Joe. Have you betrayed me? Did you give me the real stone? And Darth and Joe knew, uh-oh, I guess we can't just uh, be rid of the Emperor that easily. We're going to have to do something else. We're going to need we're gonna need some help. And um, so they decided to call their old friend Yoda. Yoda is not old. Yoda is Yoda's friend, Yoda. Yeah, yeah, whatever. Okay, so Yoda came, came over because they have a direct line. They can call, they have a special phone because they were in Jedi training school and it reaches the Jedi planet. And so Yoda came over right away on his spaceship. Luckily, he hitched a ride with um, Dr. Watt, who was another Time Lord. So it didn't take him any time at all to get there to, to Darth and Joe's planet. And Yoda wants to help Darth and Joe, does Yoda. Well, Yoda, the Emperor is in that Death Star. Oh, Death Star big, number two Death Star. Yes, yes, and he's going to destroy our planet and, and possibly the whole galaxy. Uh, destroying galaxy is a bad thing, says Yoda. Yeah, yeah, okay, Yoda, but can you help us? Yoda, help you, does Yoda. All right, we're going to um, fly up there in this spaceship. Yoda, take your own spaceship. Yoda's spaceship is the... Okay, okay, take your own spaceship. But we have to transport you up into the Death Star. And so they took the spaceships up there, and then they transported in and grabbed Yoda and transported with him into the Death Star. And um, holding on to Yoda, they were able to... Well, actually, Yoda's such a good Jedi warrior that he can slip by stormtroopers undetected. All he has to say is, You see not, Yoda. You, you sleep now. And the stormtroopers say... We see not Yoda, we sleep, and they fall asleep. So he's able to slip by them. And Darth and Joe um, transported back into the room with the Emperor. And meanwhile, Yoda snuck in through the front door, and the Emperor said, Darth and Joe, that, that stone, that rock you gave me, that wasn't the real rune of Akbar, was it? And Darth and Joe said, we don't know what you're talking about. And, and the Emperor said, this, this, and he held up the stone, and then Yoda snuck up from behind the Emperor, and he bonked him on the head, and the Emperor fell unconscious. <laughs> and then the Emperor woke up and said, hey, somebody bonked me on the... And Yoda bonked him on the head again, and he fell unconscious. And then they decided that the only thing... The Jedis, the Jedi Council decided they had to dismantle that evil, terrible weapon that the Emperor was trying to use, and they had to hide the rune of Akbar or whatever it was called. That red rune was too dangerous in the, if it fell into the wrong hands, like the Emperor's hands. And so they hid the rune inside that white box again. But this time, they hid the rune um, in a secret cave on Sally's planet, uh, the planet where Darth and Joe originally met Sally. And it, they put a special force field around it and an alarm system so if anybody ever tries to take that stone again, an alarm will go off and the Jedis will know about it. And also the Time Lords, they hooked up so they could hear about it too. Whew. So once again, Darth and Joe and their friends saved the galaxy and quite possibly the entire universe. The end. Now it's time for a story of a peaceful planet peopled by butts. In fact, the planet was a big, blue, beautiful ball of butts. The butts were very happy living on butt planet in their butt world. They were ruled by the benevolent Queen Carpagius and her husband, King Glutimus Maximus. Well, one day, the butts were out basking in the sun, 
when King Ludimus Maximus felt something dripping on his head and he looked up and he said, oh no, tree butt diarrhea, everybody inside, because they had a problem. Sometimes when there would be storms, there would be tree butt diarrhea that would drip on their heads and it was very stinky indeed. Not that the butts didn't, they didn't mind the smell, but it was very difficult to clean up. In fact, the butts actually liked the smell of diarrhea. The butts used to make music out of farts. They had a whole symphony orchestra that farted. <laughs> Like that, but much more beautiful than that because there would be hundreds of butts farting in unison, farting together to create a beautiful symphonic butt fart sound. But in this case, they had to go inside because it was raining diarrhea. And the que Queen Carpagia said, wait a minute, that's not tree butt diarrhea. At least it's not the usual tree butt diarrhea. Look, we're under attack. And she pointed in the air. And sure enough, the diarrhea was being squirted out of space spaceships that looked like giant pairs of underwear and the underwear underwear were jumping out of the underwear spaceships that were floating in the air and they were using underwear as parachutes so it would land gently on the ground and they were squirting diarrhea at all the butts and the butts didn't know what to do they were running around because these butts hated being squirted by underwear and they were trying to wipe themselves off and they were running inside but there were only so many bathrooms they could hide inside and quickly king uh, Glutimus Maximus and Queen Carpagius got together all of the wisest butts, all of the best butt heads in the land, and they decided we need a plan, we need to protect ourselves. And so they decided to create weapons, and they they created a, a giant ketchup squirter and mustard squirters that squirted in the underwear. The underwear hated that, but still the underwear kept tacking. There were more and more underwear, and they were jumping on the butts when they were capturing and wrapping themselves around the butts. And the butts were crying. It, it's very messy when butts cry because because I don't even want to describe what happens, but let me just say this, that you don't want to see a butt crying. And the underwear are attacking, and the king and queen, they decided to build a huge fort out of titanium to, because it was the strongest metal they could find to block the underwear, and they, they created giant legs out of out of titanium they they uh, robot legs which would walk on the underwear and try to squish it but the underwear were very fast and besides when you step on underwear it doesn't matter when you step off them they just pop right back up again and attack you so it was a very dangerous situation all around and the underwear had a had their own weapon goopy goop and they were squirting goopy goop at the butts oh goopy goops is getting in my butt face said king um glutimus maximus and all of the butts were running around and bumping into each other and falling over well just then they were saved by a superhero who happened to be flying around the planet and noticing that there were all these people squirting each other with disgusting fluids and it was Nonviolent man! He fights the forces of evil, not the people doing evil. That's his slogan. And he landed on a planet. What can I do? And suddenly, Goopy Goop splattered in his face. And King um, Glutimus Maximus said, Nonviolent man, thank goodness you're here. You must destroy the underwear people. And and the underwear people said, No, no, no. It is the butts. They are not cooperating. You must destroy them. And Nonviolent Man knew instantly that he had to find out what the real problem was because his motto, as I said, was to fight the forces of evil. That is to say, fight the problem, not the people doing the problem. And so Nonviolent Man flew up to the main spaceship of the underwear people, the largest underwear of all, which is floating above all the other underwear spaceships, and he knocked on the door, bing, 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 and the underwear unzipped and let him inside, and he said, what is going on? Why are you attacking the butt people? And the underwear people said, we're not attacking them, we're just trying to get warm. It is so cold. What do you mean, get warm? Well, the butts are very warm indeed, and we happen to fit so nicely over the butts, we just wanted to absorb some of their warmth because it's cold in the space. We can't take it anymore. We come from a very cold planet. It was warm, but then our sun exploded. We have no choice. We will die if we don't wrap ourselves around these butts, said the underwear people. I understand, said Nonviolent Man. Flew back down to the planet and explained the entire situation to Queen Carpagius and the King Glutimus Maximus, and they said, great, well, tell them to go to the sun. And, and Nonviolent Man said, go to the sun, said the underwear people, and they looked up at the sun, and they turned and said, well, we'll, we'll, we'll burn up if we go into the sun. He said, they'll burn up if they go into the sun. And so the king and queen got together with all the wise buttheads, and they said, hey, why don't we just um, make some space heaters for these guys. Well, you better make them uh, so that they are non-flammable because we wouldn't want to catch the underwear on fire, said Nonviolent Man. And so they agreed. And so they made some heaters. And the underwear 
um, huddled around the heaters and got warm, and it stopped the war. And everybody was so happy that they didn't have to fight anymore, that the underwear and the butt people decided to live together in harmony on the same planet, and they learned a lot from each other. One thing they learned was how to play parachute games where the butts would hold on to the underwear and use them as parachutes and jump off of mountains and floop down. And so the butts were having a great deal of fun. And actually, the underwear would give them rides, or the butts would give the underwear rides around on their butts sometimes too. So they really ended up being, a, it, it turns out that underwear and butts get along really well together after all. And so the uh, nonviolent man flew off to go save another part of the galaxy. And that's pretty much how the story ended. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Now I'd like to tell you a Darth and Joe story. This is a story that takes place once upon a time when Darth was six and his cousin Joe Vader was four. And their mom was taking them across on a trip across the country in the family hovercraft. And they were listening to a tape in the car that their cousin had made for them. He was telling them a story of an adventure of Benjam Petroni. And the tape was really interesting that they were listening to because it was all about Goopy Goop and how these crawling eyeballs were coming out from under the carpet and squirting Goopy Goop in everybody's face faces and then jumping and attaching themselves to their faces and then people would have extra eyes and the eyes just lived there. They were sort of benevolent parasites. I mean, they, they were like parasites. They would live on people, st stuck to the goopy goop, but and people would be able to see in directions they had never seen before. If the eye landed on the top of your head, you'd be able to see up all the time and that it's very dangerous to look directly into the sun. So a lot of times people would put hats on, but then the eyes would get upset so they would put you know, hats would mesh screening on so they could see a little bit out. And sometimes an eyeball would jump right onto somebody's butt. And then they would have a, an eye butt. And they would see out of their butt. So there was a story going on. And they pulled over in a rest stop area because their mom wanted to go to the bathroom. And they pulled in. And it was in a kind of a wooded area. There were, there were woods around. And it's a very pretty rest stop. And there was a sign. And the mother got out and Darth's mother got out and um, said, you boys stay here in the car, I'll be right back. And uh, Joe asked Darth to read the sign. And so Darth started reading the sign and the first word was P-L-E-A-S, please. And then he looked at the next sign and the next word was D-O, please do, please do. The sign says please do. But there were more words on it. What does the rest of the sign say, asked Joe. And so Darth looked at the rest of the sign. N-O-T, please do not. And about that time, they heard a sort of a growling sound. <coughs> Did you hear that, asked Joe. But Darth was too busy reading the sign. Please do not F-E-E-D. Feed, please do not feed. And the growling sound got bigger. And Darth said, Quiet, Joe, I'm trying to read the sign. Please do not feed. The next word was a trickier one T H E. Please do not feed T H the. The. Please do not feed the. And right, right then, a giant monster as big as a house with three heads walked up to the car and uh, Joe was tapping Darth on the shoulder. Uh, Darth, there's this, um, ma uh, uh, Darth. But Darth said, wait, wait, wait a minute. Please do not feed th the, and the, and outside the car, this monster s tapped on the window, and they were driving in the family hovercraft, which had windows that Joe rolled down the window, and, uh, and the monster said, please feed me. I'm very hungry. And Joe said, uh, okay, we, we have a whole bunch of peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, probably more than we could eat. And the monster said, that would be delicious. So Do Joe reached down into the family cooler and pulled out a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and handed it to the monster just as Darth finished reading the sign. Please do not feed the M-O-N-S-T-E-R. Please do not feed the monster. Please do not feed the monster, it says. But it was too late. The monster had gobbled down the peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And just when he did that, 
The monster grew the size of another house. Now it was two houses big. And he was walking over to another car at the rest stop, tapping on their door. And they were feeding him. And then he was three houses big. And, and so Joe and Dar said, uh-oh, this monster is growing out of control. What's going on? I'll tell you what's going on, said a voice. Who are you? And outside the car was a man in a white lab coat. My name is Dr. Man in a white lab coat, and I, I'm an environmentalist, and I was studying this monster. You're gonna, you know, you know, you're not, didn't, you, didn't you read the sign? It says, please do not feed the monster. And Darth and Joe read this said, yeah, well, it was too late. We already fed him. Oh, dear, oh, dear. How come he how grows every time he eats so much? It's because, said Man in a white lab coat, he's run out of his natural food, monster berries. Monster berries? Yes, yes, here, here, I'll show you. Come here. And they got out of the car, and the man took them into the woods, and he showed them a scrawny little plant, a dried up stem, and little leaves, and a tiny berry. And the man said, But well, this is a monster berry. And Darth and Joe thought, Hmm, for a plant called a monster berry, it sure does look small. And the man said, Normally they're a lot bigger. In fact, they're supposed to grow as big as a car, and the monster can eat them for. Oh, days. One berry feeds. And the thing is that these monster berries are so low fat and high in nutrition that the monster never grows. See, l monsters are only, sp these monsters are only supposed to be about the size of a, of your thumb. They could eat one of these berries for weeks. Oh, well, well what went wrong? Well, just look at this monster berry. It's not growing at all. It's because its environment has been poisoned. Poisoned? S S Darth suddenly getting very interested. What do you mean? Well, it's the factory upstream. See this, this, see this stream running down through? And he pointed to the stream in the woods. Yes. Well, there's a raincoat factory. They make rubber raincoats right up there. And they're polluting the stream, and that's not allowing the monster berries to grow correctly. And that's why that monster is so hungry. But when he eats uh, or other foods, like human foods, he grows out of proportion. Now look at him. And they looked. And even though the monster was in the rest stop and not in the woods, and it was pretty far away, they could see he was already as tall as a building. <laughs> oh, we've got to do something about this, said, said Darth Joe. Yeah, right. And so they decided to go up and pay the, the factory a visit. So they walked up a path to the woods, and they saw it was a big gray factory. And it says raincoats are us on the side of it and they knocked on the door and the scientist was along with them and instead of opening a door a little window slid open in the door and somebody looked out through the window stuck his nose and eyes and looked out through the window and said what do you want and and jo uh, joe said we're here to talk to you about your factory. It's poisoning the stream and, and causing the monster berry population not to grow very well in the soil. And the voice said, oh, you're with that scientist guy. Get out of here. Leave us alone. And he shut the window. And they knocked on the door again, but nobody answered. And the door was locked. And there weren't any other doors they could see. Hmm, this is a very serious problem, thought Darth, Darth and Joe. But there was something very suspicious about that face in in there yeah oh i i, I know that too said joe for one thing w the guy he w he was i he, he his eye when he looked through that door did you notice that his eye was right above his nose aren't most people their eyes on our on the left or the right side above i mean your eye isn't usually right above your nose it's off to the side right Yes, exactly. Who could that have been? Hmm, they thought about it. There's only one person I know, said Joe, who has an eye right in the middle of his forehead. Who's that? Monoculus! <gasps> yeah, that's right. That was Monoculus. It didn't sound like him. He was disguising his voice. This is very suspicious indeed. And so they looked, and they saw that there was a little crack under the door. Gosh, if we could just fit under this doorway, we could look inside of this factory and see what's really going on. But, of course, they were too big to fit under the door. I know. 
We could use our rings of transportation, said Doris. And so they used the rings of They told the scientists, we'll be right back. Stay, you might want to stay far away. This could be dangerous. And so they transported inside the factory. And as soon as they were inside the factory, um, they saw, yes, that's monoculus in the middle of the room. And he saw them and he said, guards, get them. And the guards ran toward Darth and Joe. You, luckily, they had their rings of invisibility, which they turned on. <laughs> so they, now they're invisible, and they ran out of the way of the guards. And the guards reached around and kept reaching through the air, but couldn't get them. And so Darth and Joe walked toward the middle of the factory to see what was going on in this raincoat factory. And they saw that it wasn't a raincoat factory at all. Look at those machines. They're building some sort of weapons. They looked closely at the weapons, and it said blasters. And then they heard the phone ring. Ring! And um, uh, Monoculus uh, asked Trioculus to get the phone. Could you get the phone, son? It's probably for you anyway. I, you get so many phone calls here. And Trioculus walked over to the telephone and said, yes? Mm-hmm. Yes, we'll have that order for you in six weeks. Yes. Okay, thanks. Bye. And Trioculus said, Dad, it was the Emperor on the phone. He needs these blasters in six weeks. And, and Monoculus said, Oh, we'll have them done in time. Uh, 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 the only problem is now Darth and Joe are suspicious. And, and Trioculus said, Well, they think it's a raincoat factory like the sign says outside. They won't suspect anything. And that's, uh, that's when Darth and Joe uncloaked, un took off the rings of invisibility and said, that's where you're wrong. We know this is a blaster factory. What? How did you get in here? And they took out their lightsabers. They weren't Jedi warriors yet, but they did practice a lot with their lightsabers. And since Trioculus and Monoculus didn't have any lightsabers, they said, guards, get them. And the guards, who were robot guards, started running toward Darth and Joe. But Darth and Joe used their lightsabers and broke off bits of the robot. First a robot arm, then a robot leg, then another robot leg, then a third robot leg, then a robot head, then the other robot head. And pretty soon they had destroyed all of the guard robots. Hello, Akiva. And they destroyed all of the guard robots and, and, and Trioculus and Monoculus started running away. But um, Joe transported to the other side of them, in front of them, and so now Darth and Joe, Joe's on one side of them and Darth was on the other. And they said, you better surrender now. And Trioculus and said, said, never, Dad, into the escape pod. And they jumped through a, they pressed a button on a wall and ran through a secret door and got into an escape pod whoosh, and blasted off. So they were blasted off in the air. But in the meantime, um, Joe had opened up the front door to show the scientists this factory, no wonder it pollutes so much. It's making weapons for the Empire. Oh, weapons for the Empire? Oh, that's, that's terrible. But now we've stopped it, and they turned off the, all, all the machines. And we've got to destroy these weapons. And, uh, and the scientist said, I'll call the police. And he took out his cell phone. And he called the police and, um, who came, and they collected all of the evil weapons. And um, they decided to start an environmental project to clean up the stream. And pretty soon... The water was clean, and the soil was recuperated and was clean again, and the monster berries were growing giant. And um, when that giant monster got back onto a diet of ordinary monster berries, he started shrieking down back to his normal size. And he was much happier like that because he was att attracting a lot of attention as a giant monster the size of, well, by this time he was the size of the John Hancock building. And so... Then Darth and Joe realized, wait, it's been hours. Mom said to wait in the car. What are we going to do? Oh, I don't know who would have a plan, <laughs> said, said Joe, hoping that Doctor Who would appear. But Doctor Who didn't appear. Instead, Sally appeared from behind them. Did you call the doctor? Um, and Darth said, well, uh, Joe s said something about the doctor. And Sally said, yes, I remember this from the last time we had this adventure. Well, he told me to tell you to get into the TARDIS, quick. And sure enough, the TARDIS was standing there, and they got inside the TARDIS, and they waved goodbye to the scientist. And, and the doctor said, Darth and Joe, how can I help you? And he, they said, could you bring us back in time about two and a half hours? Because our mom's going to be uh, very worried for us, and if we could just go back in time, then we'd be able to get there before she leaves, and um, I mean, before she comes back. And so he said, no problem. And the TARDIS took off. 
went back in time two and a half hours. They got back in the car. See you later. Just when Darth's um, mom was coming back into the car, and she said, well, boys, I hope you didn't have to wait too long. And they said, oh, no, no problem, Mom. And, and she said, what's this sign that says, do not feed the monster? And, um, and Darth said, well, it's a long story, Mom, but we'll put it on tape someday for you. Let's keep going. And so she drove off on their way to Rhode Island, and they put back the tape on where they were listening to the adventures of Ben Jan Petroni, who was wearing a titanium suit of armor to protect himself from a monster that was eating the roof of his house, and he had to squirt goopy gloop in its face to stop the monster. The end. Here's a story called Love You Forever, written by Robert Munch and illustrated by Sheila McGraw. And on the cover, there's a picture of a baby playing in the bathroom on the floor with toilet paper, making a huge mess with, looks like, toothpaste is spilled on the ground, and sh oh, baby oil is spilled, and powder, and there's, oh, the baby's holding up a watch. I hope he doesn't flush it down the toilet. Let's see what the book says. I love you, it's called Love You Forever. This is the first page. A mother held her new baby and very slowly rocked him back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And while she held him, she sang, I'll love you forever, I'll like you for always, as long as I'm living, my baby you'll be. The baby grew. He grew and he grew and he grew. He grew until he was two years old, and he ran all around the house. He pulled all the books off the shelves, he pulled all the food out of the refrigerator, and he took his mother's watch and flushed it down the toilet. Sometimes his mother would say, this kid is driving me crazy. But at nighttime, when the two-year-old was quiet, she opened the door to his room, crawled across the floor, looked up over the side of his bed, and if we, he was really asleep, she picked him up and rocked him back and forth, back and forth back and forth. While she rocked him, she sang, I'll love you forever, I'll like you for always, as long as I'm living, my baby you'll be. The little boy grew. He grew and he grew and he grew. He grew until he was nine years old, and he never wanted to come in for dinner. He never wanted to take a bath, and when Grandma visited, he always said bad words. Sometimes his mother wanted to sell him to the zoo. And he made, believe me, he made a big mess in the house. But at nighttime, when he was asleep, the mother quietly opened the door to his room, crawled across the floor, and looked up over the side of the bed. If he was really asleep, she picked up that nine-year-old boy and rocked him back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And while she rocked him, she sang, I love you forever, I like you for always. As long as I'm living, my baby, you'll be. The boy grew. He grew and he grew and he grew. He grew until he was a teenager. He had strange friends and he wore strange clothes and he listened to strange music. Sometimes a mother felt like she was in a zoo. But at nighttime, when that teenager was asleep, the mother opened the door to his room, crawled across the floor and looked up over the side of the bed. If he was really asleep, she picked up that great big boy and rocked him back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. While she rocked him, she sang, I love you forever, I like you for always, as long as I'm living, my baby you'll be. That teenager grew. He grew and he grew and he grew. He grew until he, beca he became a grown-up man. He left home and got a house across town moved into that house. But sometimes, on dark nights, the mother got into her car and drove across town. If all the lights in her son's house were out, she opened his bedroom window, crawled across the floor, and looked up over the side of his bed. If that great big man was really asleep, she picked him up and rocked him back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And while she rocked him, she sang, I love you forever. I'll like you for always, as long as I'm living, my baby you'll be. Well, that mother, she got older. She got older and older and older. One day she called up her son and said, 
You'd better come see me because I'm very old and sick. So her son came to see her. When he came in the door, she tried to sing the song. She sang, I love you forever. I like you for always. But she couldn't finish because she was too old and sick. The son went to his mother. He picked her up and rocked her back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And he sang this song. I'll love you forever. I'll like you for always. As long as I'm living, my mommy you'll be. When the son came home that night, he stood for a long time at the top of the stairs. Then he went into the room where his very new baby daughter was sleeping. He picked her up in his arms and very slowly rocked her back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And while he rocked her, he sang, I love you forever, I like you for always, as long as I'm living, my baby you'll be. The end. Well, let me tell you a story about a man named Eric on a tragic and faithful day. He put ten cents in his pocket, kissed Sylvia and Asa, went to ride on the Bloomington Transit. Did he ever return? No, he never returned, and his fate is still unlearned. He may ride forever neath the streets of Bloomington. He's the man who never returned. Now that train was driving from a blooming tender Rhode Island, and Eric saw his stop was plain. But when he tried to get off, the conductor told him, One more nickel! Eric couldn't get off that train. Did he ever return? No, he never returned, and his fate is still unlearned. He may ride forever neath the streets of Bloomington. He's the man who never returned. Now every day Sylvia goes to the Rhode Island station at a quarter past two, and through the open window she hands Eric a tofu sandwich as a train comes a-rumbling through. Did he ever return? No, he never returned, and his fate is still unlearned. He may ride forever neath the streets of Bloomington. He's the man who never returned. Just sit right back and you'll hear a tale, a tale of a fateful trip that started from this tropic port aboard this tiny ship. The mate was a mighty sailing man, the skipper brave and sure. Five passengers set sail that day for a three-hour tour. A three-hour tour. The weather started getting rough. The tiny ship was tossed. If not for the courage of the fearless crew, the minnow would be lost. The ship set ground on the shore of this uncharted desert isle, with Gilligan, the skipper too, the millionaire and his wife, the movie star, the professor and Mary Ann, here on Gilligan's Isle. So this is the tale of our castaways, they're here for a long, long time. That's right. They'll have to make the best of things, it's, it's an, an uphill climb. climb. The first mate and his skipper too, will do their very best <laughs> to make the others comfortable in their tropic, tropic island, island nest. nest. No foe, no light, no oh, motor please. car, not a single luxury. Mm -mm. Like Robinson Crusoe, it's primitive, primitive as can, can be. be. So join us here each week, my friends. Be sure to get us from seven stranded castaways here on Gilligan's Isle. Once upon a time, a galoomp was walking down the street, singing do wa diddy diddy wa dum diddy wa, which is what, is what a galoomps tend to sing whenever they have problems with their butts. This time he had a big butt problem because he had monster but diarrhea! And he had to get someplace quickly because when a galoomp has diarrhea, he can't use an ordinary toilet. In fact, he can't use an ordinary crater or an ordinary canyon. He has to find a hole big enough to put 200,538,641.7 gallons of diarrhea in very quickly. The galoomp didn't have much time. 
do what did he did he want did he want do what did he he was singing faster and faster and finally a galore came up and said you must have a big butt monster diarrhea problem and he was right because galorps can recognize that sort of thing in galoops here i'll help you because the galorp didn't want his entire family to be drowned in a huge wave an ocean of diarrhea from the galoop butt which could happen any second now try to hold in your butt cheeks together and he the galorp got a giant um clothespin and he clamped the galoop's butt cheeks together to hold his butt together but there's only a matter of time when the force from the diarrhea would push open the butt cheeks and explode off the clothespin and cause a shower of diarrhea to swallow up the entire planet so the galorp thought i've got to get this gloom off this planet right away and so he called his friend the foot um, the foot is actually a sort of a superhero. He's, he's a little limited because he's only a big foot and he has no other body parts. But he called him up on the phone. Unfortunately, the foot can't answer the phone because he has no mouth, no hands to pick up the phone with, no way to talk on the phone. The foot's not answering, said the Galorp. I'll have to go there myself. Hold on. And he jumped his highest. He jumped all the way to the moon. Well, that pushed the planet out of orbit. Because when you, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So when he pushed away from the planet, this Galorp, the planet pushed in the opposite direction. Well, he landed on the moon, which caused a huge moon quake. But people were used to that by now who lived on that moon. And meanwhile, he looked back for the planet that the Galoomp was on. And it was spiraling out of control toward the sun. Oh, no. What am I going to to do and by that time the gloom couldn't hold it anymore and the clothespin exploded the diarrhea shot out well luckily the gloom was on his hands and knees when that happened so the diarrhea shot into the sun forcing the planet back in the other direction back to its original location and the gloom saw that everything was all right and he brought a huge force full of toilet paper back to the gloom the end